Questions without notice? <coughs> Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question uh, is to Senator Cook, representing the Treasurer, and uh, I refer him to the. Uh, Order. And to make about ministerial arrangements. Order, Senator. Yeah, it's just. <coughs> it's uh, yes, further order, arrangements. Leaves ground to Senator Evans. Further arrangements announced on 14 November I inform the Senate that Senator McMullen will remain overseas on official government business until the 28th of November and will therefore be absent from question time today and tomorrow. He is visiting Washington to participate in discussions with agricultural leaders and to lobby for Australia's interests during the finalisation of the new farm bill. In his absence from question time today and tomorrow, I'll continue to take questions on trade. Senator Collins will represent the Minister for Communications and the Arts and Senator Bolkus will represent the Minister for Admin Services. Thank you, Senator. Senator Short. If you'd like to start again, please. Thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question is to Senator Cook, representing the Treasurer, and I refer to the fact that uh, in the last few days, two of Australia's most respected business leaders have given the Keating uh, government uh, the thumbs down. Uh, first, the uh, retiring Woolworths chairman, Paul Simons, uh, saying that the uh, economy is fragile, and uh, yesterday, the uh, ANZ uh, Bank uh, chief, Don Mercer, attacked the government on its uh, superannuation and microeconomic uh, reform uh, policies and its inability to deliver a responsible surplus, uh, budget surplus. And I ask the minister, why should the Australian community not believe Mr Mercer when he says that the government's failed policies are likely to cause a rise in interest rates next year? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cook. Mr President, uh, of course the government doesn't uh, speculate in interest rates. Senator Short knows that. This is a provocative question. He is playing politics once again. It's got nothing to do with real information. Mr President, uh, however, uh, Don Mercer did say a few things about the Australian economy yesterday. And uh, if the opposition, as it sometimes does, describe the Australian economy as highly vulnerable, then I wonder how they would rate an economy with an average growth over five years of 2.5 per cent and inflation of 10 per cent. How would you rate an economy of that sort? Order. But uh, that's what their leader, Mr Howard, achieved when Order. he was Treasurer, Mr President. Under his economic stewardship, the average real economic growth rate was 2.5 per cent and the average inflation rate was 10 per cent. Later this week, the Australian Bureau of Statistics will release the latest uh, national accounts data. After four years of continuous economic growth, these data are expected to show that the economy has chalked up yet another quarter of economic growth. And all the signs are that the economy is set to continue growing, not just for several more quarters, but indeed for several more years yet. Even with the uh, recent moderation in growth, Australia, it should be noted, still has one of the fastest growing economies in the whole of the OECD. And, uh, Mr President, the transition to long-term sustainable growth is now being reflected in the economic data. These data show activity moderating in some sect sectors, of course, such as housing uh, industry, but as well and as well in some of the regions. However, one of the hallmarks of sustainable growth is that those parts of the economy with moderating levels of activity are matched by others in which activity is growing strongly. Uh, for instance, as housing construction started to decline late last year, non-dwelling construction began to pick up and is now growing strongly. Robust exports and rural recovery are also showing important sources of strength to the economy. The transition earlier this year from extremely high, unsustainable levels of growth to more moderate but still strong levels is only now being reflected in the labour force data. That's because employment is a lagging indicator. It provides a better measure of where the economy has been in the recent past rather than where the economy is now or where it will be in the future. Mr President, in this question Senator Short also referred to superannuation and uh, Mr Mercer made some remarks about superannuation uh, in his Business Sunday interview yesterday. What should be remembered that, that Mr Mercer was speaking for the banks. The banks have an obligation to their shareholders to make a profit and distribute the profit to their shareholders. Superannuation funds, to whom he wasn't so kind, have an obligation not to make a profit and through their trustees to distribute the, uh, the advantages to their members. And that's an important distinction when one goes into the debate about whether banks should have a bigger role in superannuation as opposed to industry funds. 
But, Mr. President, uh, the position of industry funds in the superannuation industry must also be kept into perspective. Data from the ISC show that total superannuation assets currently are around $190 billion and that industry funds have assets of around $9 billion. I conclude uh, this facetious, uh, an answer to this facetious question by saying that, uh, that uh, yesterday we had Mr Howard saying that there is not much fat in the economy to, to cut out in terms of the budget because uh, the fat that existed 10 to 15 years or so ago has gone. I remind the Senate who was Treasurer 10 to 15 years ago. John Howard. Who cut it out? We did. That's why there's not much fat now. Yet at the same time, in contradistinction to his leader, we have Mr Costello running around Australia making flagrant uh, promises of new expenditure while opposing over the last four years $11 billion plus the uh, in, terms time of, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of budget, Ministers, in terms of budget time income. Has expired. Supplementary, Senator Shaw. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I, I note from that further blustering attempt to uh, <laughs> to uh, hide the, the, the issues and gild the lily that the that the uh, Senator Cook has again failed to uh, provide any substantive answer to the the questions that are put to him. And I note, in particular, that the minister has not denied uh, Mr. Mercer's uh, contention that on the government's uh, present uh, policies interest rates are likely to rise next week, despite the fact uh, Mr. President, that they are already amongst the highest in the Western world. And I repeat to him again the question, and give him another chance at it, how is the government going to achieve Order. an underlying uh, economic policy framework that will avoid interest rate increases inevitably occurring next year, as will be the case under their present policy stance? The minister, well, nice Senator try, Mr. President. Senator same question, different uh, clothing, but the same intent. You know, and uh, and uh, you know that every responsible government minister will not engage in speculation about the direction of interest rates. And for every commentator that says one thing in the community, Don Mercer being among them, other commentators say another thing. And uh, and I can point I can point you to a body of different commentary, none of which I well none of Order. which I endorse because I'm not going to be drawn this matter. Now, Mr President, the question is who are the better economic managers? We have the coalition lying to the Australian community about how they'll balance their budget by saying, uh, by saying they will not cut anything but by nonetheless giving away billions of dollars of special pleadings to interest groups while at the same time blocking $11 billion plus dollars of income to the budget. Now, how you work that out, Mandrake couldn't solve that problem, and no serious economic commentator in this country regards you of having any credentials at all on economic management. Every time your leader, Mr Howard, is asked about what's his economic policy, all he does is launch another expired. truck. Senator West. My question without notice is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. Minister, I understand a study Order conducted in the United Kingdom has found that Australia has one of the best and fairest systems of family assistance in the world. What information are you able to provide about the report and its findings? The Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. Uh, yes, Mr President, I am uh, very pleased to be able to tell the uh, Senate about a very interesting and very timely piece of research uh, coming out of the University of York in the United Kingdom, which is very good news for this government's policies and programs for families. The findings, um, written in particular by Dr Peter Whitford, Whiteford, are reported in the latest issue of the Social Security Journal, published by the Department of Social Security. And if anyone wants to really um, uh, get a quick skim over what this uh, uh, report is about, then they can read Ross Gitton's article in the Sydney Morning Herald today. He's actually had a very close look at it, and he actually concludes that our system does more to direct assistance to low-income families than any other system examined. Now, the other systems examined included um, Australia, studies of Australia, New Zealand, Japan, United States, Norway, Sweden and the 12 uh, countries of the European Union. And unlike a lot of other studies that we've seen recently, this study included uh, a whole variety of benefits, all cash payments, tax allowances for children, assistance with housing costs, assistance with childcare costs and the impact of the spending on health. And what uh, this uh, uh, study shows is that the package of cash benefits for low-income families in Australia was 47 per cent above the average for those 18 countries. It also found that the uh, low-income working families in Australia paid the lowest uh, level of direct taxes, which is income taxes and social security contributions, of any of those countries. So it is a, a, a very encouraging, in fact I think a very big tick 
in favour of this government's policies of targeting and directing its payments and its assistance to those most in need. If you want to compare a family with two children earning half average weekly earnings, um, pay only 40 per cent of their income tax four per cent sorry only four per cent of their income tax income in tax in 1992 that is about half the tax burden of a similar family in the United States one third the level of Japan or the United Kingdom one fifth the level of New Zealand France or Germany and less than one seventh of the taxes in Denmark and the Netherlands so it is um, a, a very very important and very useful article indeed as um, the article by Ross Gittens goes on to point out too that it is, uh, should be a very big challenge. Well, he doesn't say this, but I do, concluding from what he says, a very big challenge for the opposition's policies. A very big uh, challenge because uh, there is in the Lions Forum document uh, recommendations for how it would be best to proceed by part of the opposition on behalf of the opposition in terms of family policies, including a case made for the French quotient system. But this article points out that that's a sleight of hand and the opposition seems to have bought it. That is, because the taxes are low, the social security payments are— well, no, this is exactly what's so good about this article, Senator Abetz, Mr President, through you. You should uh, go and read the article because what it allows you to conclude that though on, uh, it's true that French families on average earnings pay no income tax, they do have to pay hefty social security contributions. And uh, were we to introduce a quotient system, the loss of income tax revenue would be so great that we'd have to introduce a GST to pay for it. In other words, the overall impact would be purely cosmetic. And he, and the article goes on to say, if we could make our family system more generous to high-income families, but only by making it less generous to low-income families. That doesn't make sense to Ross Gittins. Order. It doesn't make sense to the government. It does apparently make sense to you to redistribute away from the low-income targeted payments this government has along the income-splitting proposals. Senator Hill knows that we're into in you are looking at income-splitting, and you are also looking at the French alternative under the Lions Forum. This article, this article is absolute confirmation that the way the government is doing it is the best, and it is particularly advantageous for low-income families in this country. Senator Hill. My, my question is to the Leader of the Government and the Senate. And I, refer, I refer to the South Australian United Trades Order. and Labor Council document leaked last week that let the cat out of the bag on Labor's intended fear and loathing campaign, Order. of there course, consistent with the right. WA union blockade and Jenny George's stated intent to maintain, maintain industrial action up to the election, of course, followed by the national strikes last week. I ask, how can, how can the ALP support a Order, campaign of industrial relations disruption at great, a great cost to innocent parties, as justified for political gain? Doesn't a campaign of fear and loathing to frighten voters debase Australian politics? Why doesn't the Prime Minister show some national leadership and contest the issues rather than scare voters into submission? Or is it that Labor has in fact run out of ideas and all that you are left with is the option of a scare campaign? Order. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Mr President, so I sense a certain wistfulness on Senator Hill's part when he talks about this campaign because it's well known that Senator Hill couldn't inject fear and loathing into even a rabbit or a sheep or a lamb or a kitten in the community. You couldn't leave a mark on a soft cushion in terms of your record so far, and I can understand, I can understand, I can understand the degree of difficulty you would have in an aggressive Order. campaign by anyone about anything. And I can understand that that causes you a bit of psychological difficulty confronting that possibility. The truth of the, the truth of the Order. I see, I see. That's another McDonald, a big steaming McDonald. Order. And Senator. Mr. Just withdraw that, will you? I've made a comment on that before, and I ask you to withdraw it. Well, steam was coming out of his ears, and it was Senator Macdonald, but I, in deference to you, I withdraw it. <laughs> Mr. President, the um, uh, order, I haven't seen. Order, and could I suggest, if you answered the question rather than heaping abuse on the person who asked the question? Well, it was a silly, it was a, it was a silly empty, opportunistic question, Mr. President, and it deserves an appropriate answer. The um, kind of campaign that was mooted in that document, as Senator Hill describes it, I haven't seen it, is a fairly routine kind of an exercise so far as the trade union movement is Order. concerned. It's perfectly understandable that uh, trade unions, feeling themselves to be potentially under siege by Tory governments, both at home in South Australia and potentially here, although God knows why they should assume there's any prospect of that nationally, would want to, would want to act to preserve their position, just as the ACTU did 
and the relevant unions in the mining industry in Queensland have wanted to do. The uh, trade, union movement, no, trade union movement is perfectly entitled to defend its position. It's appropriate that it do so by time-honoured methods, not methods Order. that uh, are at odds with uh, larger community values or which cause havoc and disruption on a larger scale than is necessary to make the point. But there will always Senator be differences Ralston. of opinion about that. A little bit of uh, rhetoric, a little bit of hyperbole is to be expected in these situations. There was no more than that, I'm sure, in this situation. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to Senator Schott, representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. I refer, refer the Minister to various claims about the problem of youth unemployment and alternative approaches to address this, this problem. And I ask, can the minister provide details of how the government is developing measures to alleviate youth unemployment? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Thank you, Senator thank, thank, thank you Mr Senator President. President. First of all, the government has always put on the record that we believe uh, unemployment and youth unemployment in Australia is unacceptable, unacceptably high. However, we do want to just put down some of the remarks made round the place and comments, particularly by members opposite about the uh, level of uh, youth unemployment in Australia. The fact that full-time teenage unemployment rate is 29 per cent does not mean that 29 per cent of Australian teenagers are unemployed. That's because only 25 per cent of teenagers were available for, for, for full-time work in October. 55 per cent were in school and 13 per cent were in full-time post-school education. What we should focus on is the 95,600 teenagers looking for full-time work, which is 7.3 per cent of the teenage population. And it's worth noting, of course, that we have in government reduced this number from John Howard's 158,000 in 1983, which amounted to over 12 per cent of, teen of the total teenage population being unemployed. Mr. Mr. President, we have made, I think it's time that, the, that uh, the public understood that there is quite a difference in the way the opposition has been misleading, uh, the, uh, in making misleading comments on unemployment. We have, uh, through our Working Nation statement and Working Nation policies, that the number of long-term unemployed uh, for young people has fallen 10 per cent over the year to October 1995. However, we do want to bring it down even further, and that's the thrust of the Working Nation, the Working Nation initiatives. And last week, the Minister Cream released the results of discussions with 700 young people around the country about employment and labour market programs. These consultations show that young people want more traineeships in growth areas, more options for vocational education and training at schools, and better service from the CES. The Minister has indicated that, all of the, that he's looking at all of these things to improve further how we can address these issues raised by young people. He's already expressed a willingness to encourage the use of schools more effectively to provide pathways to work. We are expanding the options for Year 11 and 12 students to pursue more vocational streams of education. We're increasing the opportunities for school leavers to go to university, TAFE or structured training in a job. Last financial year, 69,500 trainees and apprentices commenced work, nearly 5 per cent more than in 1993-94. And since Labor took office, we have increased school retention rates from 40 per cent to 75 per cent and university places by 64 per cent. The point we make all about this, we have not heard once from the opposition, though they are greatly critical of the working nation, what they would replace it with what they would do to create youth unemployment. The last policy we have announced from the opposition is, of course, that they will reduce the youth, the youth wage to $3 an hour. That's the last time we've heard any policy initiative in three years and over three years from the opposition about what they would do for young people in employment in Australia. The last effort they made, of course, was to have we had a youth bus a couple of months ago heading north with uh, the young boys on the bus from the Liberal Party, oh, Chris no. Pine and Senator Campbell. And now we have the youth truck wandering around Australia, again putting forward this misleading information that 29 per cent of all teenagers 
in Australia are unemployed. In fact, it's only 7 per cent of all teenagers in Australia. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Evans, as Leader of the Government in the Senate. How valid is the claim that the Camalco dispute has been settled when the picket at Weeper continues to be in place? Is it not a fact that the unions have now ignored three Commission recommendations that they disband the picket and return to work? Does the government condemn this defiance of the Commission by the trade union movement? And furthermore, doesn't this represent the dramatic failure of your industrial relations policy and further proof of the determination of Jenny George and the ACTU to stage an ongoing industrial campaign designed to bring the country to its knees Order, industry Senator by Cook. industry. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. Mr President, Order. of course we uh, would wish that the striking workers uh, Senator Abetz is not even interested in the reply. Of course, the, we would wish that the striking workers would return to work as soon as possible in accordance with the Commission decision. Uh, and, uh, of course, it is the government's position that they should do so. My understanding of the ACTU position, contrary to yours, is that, uh, as stated by Mr Kelty, the striking uh, miners have decided not to return to, week, to return to work until the ACTU Disputes Committee reconvenes early this week. And Ms Jenny George, the ACTU president-elect, is um, expected to speak to them at Weeper on Wednesday to try to convince them to return to work. That's utterly at odds with the imputation contained in Senator Abetz's question that the ACTU was in fact determined or concerned or keen to keep this particular dispute going. That's not the case. The ACTU is committed to getting back to work. We obviously want the issue resolved, as does the ACTU, before the Commission, and of course the Commission's orders and directives should be respected. <coughs> Supplementary, Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I wonder if the Leader of the Government uh, can recall the words of uh, Bill Kelty when he said that the dispute at Weeper was about the heart, soul, and purpose of the trade union movement in this country. Given that the government has an accord with the ACTU, how much input does the government have to the ACTU policy in relation to the dispute at Weeper? The Minister, Senator Evans. Yes, I do recall those words being used, and of course it was about the heart and soul of the union movement, as perceived by the union movement, and to some extent, so far as the government was concerned, to the extent that what was on at Weeper was an exercise in trying to basically de-unionise a mine force and to reduce over time a capacity for collective bargaining to take place at all in circumstances described by the uh, business press as uh, entitling uh, the workers to be concerned about the long-term implications of what was going on. So, of course, it was a legitimate issue for the trade union movement to respond to, as was the associated issue of equal pay for work of equal value. They are the issues that are being resolved before the Commission at the moment. That principle has been accepted uh, by the Commission. The ACTU has won the case already so far as the basic issues of principle are concerned. Well, all that remains to happen now uh, is for the issue to be resolved in terms of the dollars and cents and the particular situation of the particular workforce. And the ACTU right. has made clear its willingness to try its best to ensure that they get back to work as soon as possible. And Ms George will be speaking to them with that uh, in mind uh, later this week on Wednesday, as I make clear in answer to the first part of the Senator question. Lees. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also uh, to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Minister, I refer you to the undertaking the Prime Minister has given to protect forests of high conservation value, and I ask, are you aware that many of these areas, the most valuable areas in East Gippsland, are outside all existing reserve systems, and in particular that if you look at an area in East Gippsland, indeed if you look at all of Far East Gippsland and plot the remaining rainforest, most of it is outside the reserves. If you then plot on top of that the endangered species habitat, and then line up the coops scheduled for logging this year, you'll find that they all correspond. In other words, are you aware that the Victorian government has scheduled many areas of very high conservation value for logging this year? And finally, will the federal government prevent the clear felling and wood chipping of any more rainforest in East Gippsland? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, Senator Lees will appreciate that these matters are being considered by Cabinet right now. Um, and it is a little inappropriate under those circumstances to respond specifically to any particular question about any particular areas and the maps and the regimes that may be associated with them. All I can say 
Generally, is, as she will be aware, the public consultation phase in relation to the deferred forest assessment exercise um, in Victoria finished on 3 November. During that phase, Commonwealth and Victorian officials held consultation meetings with conservation industry and community groups on the draft TFA report. Those meetings were held, I'm told, in a very good atmosphere, constructive and cooperative. A number of submissions have been received, some of which are quite detailed. The relevant officials have now started preparing a final DFA uh, report addressing those issues. Um, stakeholders have been given uh, maps, more detailed maps, and arrangements have been put in place for similar maps to occur in the final DFA report. On the endangered species issue, which Senator Lees is uh, obviously particularly concerned about, I'm advised that, uh, as one would expect, a number of these issues have arisen during the consultation period I've just referred to. In Victoria, the issues uh, have involved further and will involve further consideration on the adequacy of prescriptions for species such as Leadbetter's possum, the long-footed potteroo, the spotted tree frog, the regent honeyeater and the swift parrot. Also three species, the vulnerable variegated pygmy perch, the vulnerable uh, Yarra pygmy perch and the endangered pink-tailed legless lizard were not specifically referred to in the DFA report and they are being now, several members of the opposition could uh, will satisfy that description. They're not specifically referred oh, yeah. to, particularly late at night, in some cases after lunch, but they're not specifically referred to in the DFA report and they're being checked to confirm whether their habitat would be impacted on by forest operations. There are other uh, things I could tell you about the um, conservation reserves and the Commonwealth proposed criteria, including the fact, of course, that they adopt the Commonwealth's uh, criteria very from the technical working group position that they adopt the general benchmark of 15 per cent uh, rather than 10 per cent, and they set specific targets for percentage reservation of old growth and wilderness. You ought to be familiar with that, um, and in any event it doesn't go other than indirectly to the immediate point of your question, but I don't think it's really possible to give you a complete answer until after the present uh, decision process is complete, and Senator Faulkner will no doubt be delighted to give you an answer in Parliament sometime next week on that subject. Supplementary, Senator Lees. Uh, I just remind Order. you, Minister, that we won't in fact be sitting next week, but I do look forward to seeing uh, the results of de deliberations. I wasn't asking you for the results, however. I was more looking for information as to whether you in particular, as a Senator of Victoria, um, have had the opportunity to look at what is actually happening in East Gippsland. So perhaps as a supplementary, I can ask you, have you seen the results of rainforest logging in East Gippsland? And in particular, uh, if you haven't, would you be prepared to do so during the Christmas break? Minister, Senator Evans. No, I haven't done that uh, for many, many years. And um, in fact, what I've just said more than exhausts my knowledge of uh, the present situation with the forests in eastern Victoria. But I, uh, that's an excellent suggestion of uh, Senator Lees in that respect, and I'd be only too happy to find an early opportunity to do so when the uh, when the electors of Holt will allow me to escape from their restrictions for time enough to uh, address these larger policy issues. <coughs> Senator Newman. Order. Thank you, Mr Hume. President. My question is directed to the Minister for Defence. Minister, how do you respond to the comments made by General John Gray, your former Army Chief, who has said that Australia could not defend itself against a prolonged attack because of funding shortfalls and warped priorities? In that it's not only our Army that is having trouble, what priority are you giving to resolving the crisis in the Air Force over the loss of its air traffic controllers? What are you going to do to stop the continuing hemorrhage of experienced air traffic controllers from the RAAF? And will you be asking the Singaporean Air Force to bring its own air traffic controllers to RAF Pierce so that Australia can keep its air force in the air? The Minister for Defence, Senator Ray. In terms of General Gray, uh, Mr President, you can't please all the ex-generals all the time. In regard to air traffic controllers, uh, the greatest effect, the greatest effect that uh, is going to, the greatest thing that's going to affect the air force's air traffic controllers is a requirement by the CASA, I think it's now called, for 400 new air traffic controllers by 1998. And uh, the differential, the differential in salary is between uh, air force and uh, and this body after they've been through their administrative training is between seven and twenty thousand dollars a year. Therefore, uh, there's nothing that we can do in a legal sense to prevent people transferring from the Air Force across to uh, CASA. However, I have had uh, extensive discussions with them, both the Minister for Transport and uh, the head of this particular body, the executive head of this particular body, to see if we can cooperate in such a way as uh, 
those sort of deficiencies that will be caused by that recruiting will not harm the Air Force. Um, the first way we, of course, responded was to increase the amount of basic recruits that are coming into the system. And by next year, we'll be taking in something like 48 recruits a year, which is quite up on what was done in the past. Um, it would be uh, cost ineffective if you just did that and lost them. The second thing we've talked to uh, CASA about is even if they recruit them, that they return those people to cover the areas they're currently uh, servicing until, they, until the, the need arises in 1998 for them actually to go to that body. And that will do a lot to relieve the strain. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, would Singapore bring its air traffic controllers. They're having the same retention problems as the Australian Air Force. Same difficulties, if not more exacerbated, than we ha have here in Australia. So the answer to the particular problem, because uh, you raised the specific problem, is cooperation between the Air Force and CASA to make sure they have the planned needs of all around Australia. So there's no advantage to CASA in the long run in taking away Air, Air Force traffic controllers that control skies around Townsville, Sector 8 around Sydney, or to around Darwin, because they'll ne need themselves if we can't supply air traffic controllers to do that themselves. And I think the final point that we are looking at, we haven't ruled out retention bonus, even though as a principle I prefer not to get into that area. I don't think it's ever been wildly successful in the past. But secondly, we were looking to restructure the career paths that people take. And that may well have three streams over the future. Uniformed across to civilian but restaying within Air Force, which will give more stability as to posting. That is, start in uniform but eventually go to serve the Air Force um, in uh, civilian and civilian conditions. The second stream may well be go into the Air Force and then eventually go into the CASA operation. And then the third stream will be those that want to stay in uniform all the way through their careers and will provide the future leadership. It is, uh, those sort of specialist areas though, are going to present a challenge to defence as long as we remain one of the great training institutions in this country. And some of the other institutions of this country, some of the other institutions of this country, I think, are going to have to learn to do more of the training themselves than they have in the past, rather than try to poach off Air Force or some other military unit. Supplementary, Senator. Newman. I thank the minister for his answer, but of course he doesn't address the loss of experience. It's simply the uh, the uh, need to uh, recruit more people, which of course doesn't give him experience levels. Can I ask the minister, by way of supplementary? Is it correct that the number of air traffic controllers lost from the RAF is in the order of 60 to 70 and that not all of them have gone into the uh, air traffic control jobs in the civilian sector? Is it also correct that six, Sector 8, based at Sydney, which controls Richmond, should have 11 people but currently only has five? And is it also correct that RAF Pierce should have more than a dozen approach controllers for its day shift and may be down to just two by the middle of next year? Is this the magnitude, the magnitude of the problem? Does the minister have any sense of urgency about it? I didn't see any indication of that from his laid-back answer. The minister, Senator Ray. Well, it's rather ironical that we get the more substantive part of the question in the supplementary. Five questions to be answered in a minute. But what I said to you in terms of sector eight, etc., what, what action we've taken is to sit down with uh, CASA, so to make sure that these areas will not be deprived if people move out. And you are right to suggest that some people have moved out of air traffic control completely into other careers. But, I mean, that's natural. They're doing that or in the civilian and the military area. People do change careers. Not everyone will stay in the same career all their life because um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the trend of modern society. So there's nothing in my answer uh, that was intended to mislead by saying that they're all going to CASA. Some just go out and create a new career. And uh, the point that you've made that it's not the overall numbers but some of the more experienced people is right. It is crucial that you don't lose your most experienced people, those that will be training and in fact developing those new recruits through, and that's where our efforts are being concentrated. Senator Margetts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. I refer to the announcement <clears throat> yesterday of the Prime Minister's initiative for a nuclear weapons free world. And whilst I welcome Mr Keating's apparent conversion to the peace cause, I ask, do the comments in relation to the cessation of the production of fissile material outlined in yesterday's media package 
indicate that the government is prepared to reconsider its position in relation to uranium exports? And does the minister agree that the quid pro quo in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty with respect to the provision of uranium and nuclear technology to NPT signatories actually provides for the potential for non-weapon state to quickly move to nuclear weapons capability? This reality will require the Canberra Commission to totally reassess the effectiveness of the NPT as a vehicle for the elimination of nuclear weapons. <coughs> the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Well, I'm glad that uh, Senator Margetts supports the uh, Canberra Commission on the elimination of nuclear weapons. We even had a grudging acknowledgement of its utility from uh, Alexander Downer, which is a world first, and uh, I thank him for that. And I thank Senator Margetts for her support. I think it is potentially one of the most important initiatives Australia has ever taken, uh, in the sense that if we can craft an agenda for the step-by-step -step reduction of nuclear weapons. Presently there are 50,000 uh, warheads at large in the world maintaining security as we go and creating a situation ultimately of zero and hopefully sooner rather than later, then we will have made a massive uh, contribution to making this world a safer and saner place. And I believe that that objective is not only uh, desirable but attainable, and I hope very much and I expect uh, that this commission, comprised of the extraordinary array of extraordinarily highly qualified people, uh, will make a major contribution to setting that agenda moving forward. As to the implications of all of this for uh, production of fissile material and uh, other matters, including the export of uranium, um, certainly one of the things that uh, it's hoped that the Commission will consider is the virtues of a convention for the cutoff. Um, on the production of fissile material, thus ensuring that no further uh, such material is produced in the future. That should not be too hard a convention to actually negotiate, and preliminary steps have been taken toward that at the moment, because the truth of the matter is that none of the existing declared nuclear weapon states, including France, are presently engaged in the production of fissile material. And that consideration ought to put at rest uh, a concern that was expressed again, I think, last week by a number of uh, members and senators about the possibility of Australian or anyone else's uranium, for that matter, notwithstanding the safeguard system, ending up in the production of uh, military fissile material. The truth of the matter is that there's no grounds for concern about that because existing stockpiles unhappily are such, so extensive, uh, that as far as I know, and certainly this is true for France because it's been publicly confirmed, uh, no such uh, mis material is being produced, nor has it been since 1992. So under those uh, circumstances, um, there doesn't seem to be uh, any case at all uh, for concern about the way in which the uh, IAEA, IAEA safeguard system is working under the existing Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The NPT will go on being, whichever way you look at it, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty will go on being an absolutely crucial element in the total equation if we are ever to achieve a nuclear weapons free world, as I certainly hope we can. The notion that there's somehow um, something not very helpful or about the uh, NPT, which seems to run through a lot of questions that come out of the, uh, the Greens and others in the community, really does quite fundamentally miss the point. As I've said on many previous occasions, um, without it, I think we would have been looking at a world with 25 or 30 nuclear weapons possessors, nuclear weapons possessors at the moment rather than the five declared states that we have at the moment, plus, of course, a small number of uh, threshold or twilight zone states. As unsatisfactory as the present situation may be from a number of different points of view, and I don't think anyone could be totally comfortable with all aspects of it, in particular the attitude of the, some of the nuclear weapons powers, nonetheless it's far and away the best system that we have. It was crucially important that the NPT be extended indefinitely, as it was in April, and that's one of the foundation stones on which undoubtedly the uh, Canberra Commission will be building as it erects its plan for achieving a nuclear-free world. Senator Margetts on a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, don't count your chickens, Minister. Um, Despite statements to indicate that the government believes that nuclear weapons are illegal under international law, the proposed terms of reference of the Canberra Commission specifically call for the maintenance of stable deterrence. Won't the nuclear weapon states and the threshold states perceive that Australia is once again dancing to the tune of the nuclear weapon states? 
The Minister for Prisoners, Prisoners. I have exceedingly patiently sought to explain on previous occasions those propositions are not inconsistent. If you're talking about deterrence into the hereafter or strengthened deterrence, as Monsieur Chirac and uh, Mr Major were in their joint communique a few weeks ago, you would have much to complain about. But if you're talking about maintaining a system of balanced deterrence while the world moves back to zero, ensuring that in the process there's no great disparity between the nuclear weaponry available to the major powers, you are simply talking good sense. And in the submission that I made to the World Court arguing for the illegality of weapons here and now, it was a corollary to that submission that the court find or make a finding, make a direction that in achieving the reduction of nuclear weapons, it was not an obligation for any state that could do so to do it overnight, but in honouring its commitment required by customary international law, we argued, to zero, it could sensibly get there step by step, and it, would, and it should sensibly get there in an environment where the balanced deterrence principle was maintained. They're not incompatible the propositions, and I think that's very well understood. Senator Ochi. Mr President, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate. I refer to statements on Friday by Labor Party politician Mr Graham Campbell, in which he said the real Australian was Anglo-Celtic, that a racist was someone who won an argument with a multiculturalist, and in which he said Australia was about to be overwhelmed by Asian migration. He also asked Australians against further immigration to direct their preferences to the Labor Party. Will the Prime Minister now ensure that Mr Campbell is disendorsed as the Labor candidate for Kalgoorlie at the next election. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. How the, order. How the Labor Party treats its own is none of your business, uh, Senator oh, O'Chee, oh, nor will it be ever. Uh, how we react publicly to statements of this kind is, however, uh, something that should be put on the public record, and I say, frankly, I react to them with nothing short of disgust. They're utterly at odds with the principles that have been articulated by the Order. Labor Party over many years. They're absolutely at odds with the current policy of the party, and no doubt this is an issue that will be further considered by the party in the light of what I've just said. Sub Order. Mr. President, Order. 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 just take your seat until there's quiet. Order, Senator Collins. Senator Chief. Supplementary question. Supplementary. Mr. President, earlier on this year, the Prime Minister accused the Leader of the Opposition of being weak because he didn't sack a coalition senator fast enough. And now, now given that we know that the Prime Minister lacks the courage and the strength Order. to sack Mr. Campbell, and it's now quite obvious that the Prime Minister would rather tolerate Mr. Campbell within the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party than take a stand against bigotry, I ask what credibility can the Prime Minister's statement on multiculturalism have this coming Friday, and why should anybody believe a party that has such blatant double standards on racial uh, tolerance and discrimination? <coughs> the Minister, Senator Ray. The senator which you were referring Order. was, as I understand it, an office holder within the party. That's not the case for Mr Campbell. He's unlikely ever hold an office of any uh, significance within uh, the parliamentary party or within the parliament, I think. Um, and under those circumstances, Order. the options available to the Prime Minister are extremely limited. He can only operate within the parameters of the party institutions, namely the National Executive of the party. No doubt that's an issue that will be further considered by the National Executive, as it has been in the past. Senator, sorry, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, Order. Senator Commons. Minister, I recall that in August this year, at the meeting of the Agricultural Ministers, you launched the Rural Part Partnership Program. Yes, I know this program gives rural communities the opportunity to put together proposals for change which reflect the key issues that they face. Can you inform the Senate of the progress of this uh, program and which communities are now benefiting from this approach? The Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. Certainly, Mr President. I'd be glad to provide the Senate with that information. Perhaps Senator McGoran can tell us what he's doing over there and providing us with some information. You're going to launch those, are you, Jules? Oh, this, oh, this Senator, Senator Brownhill's paper. Oh, no. paper. Oh, no. Did you get on with the answer? <laughs> Mr President, uh, the Rural Partnership Order. Program is, is, was designed to it's very distracting, designed to uh, transform the way governments do business with uh, rural Australia. It provides uh, an opportunity for communities to put their collective knowledge, skills and uh, experience together 
to de deliver sustainable uh, development in their regions. The program has been developed cooperatively through ARMCANs, that is with all of the other uh, ministers for primary industry, regardless of their political affiliations, and it's designed to address nationally significant agricultural and resource management, social and environmental issues. Its most fundamental element is a recognition that people that are living and working uh, in rural areas know more about what should be done to guarantee a sustainable future for that region than anyone else. It follows these, that these people are best placed to develop future strategies in cooperation and with sometimes the necessary support that governments can provide. Mr uh, President, partnership proposals are actively being negotiated at the moment or have actually been implemented in southwest Queensland, the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia, the central west and western divisions of New South Wales, the Gascoigne Murchison region of Western Australia, and the Sunraysia and Myrtleful regions uh, in Victoria. Mr President, I'm pleased to advise the Senate that today I've approved a federal government contribution to the Atherton Tablelands region to begin work on restructuring and development of that region in light of the decline in the tobacco industry there. Mr President, it's useful, I think, to highlight the real efforts that this government is making to demonstrate its commitment to regional development, because it stands in stark contrast to the policy alternatives that are being provided by the federal coalition and, of course, most succinctly in that now infamous document produced by the Shadow Minister for Regional Development, uh, Senator Ian Macdonald, which had as its bottom line, and I quote, that the coalition will in fact make commitments, quote, giving them the flexibility of announcing a lot of major long-term visionary Order. matters but without committing the coalition to actually proceeding with them. Now, Mr President, in light of this Order. policy document from Senator Ian Macdonald, I must say that I was intrigued to receive a question on notice from Senator Macdonald recently in respect of another regional initiative which this government is providing substantial funds for, and that is the Wimmera Mallee Pipeline. Oh, I will answer the question. I will answer his question, but it was an intriguing question, the first one I've got in this sort of style, because the question asked, question on notice number 2539, quote, could the Wimmera Mallee pipeline be completed without federal government assistance? Mr President, uh, one assumes that this project will go to the top of the policy mirage created by Senator Macdonald for Regional Australia, and this of course stands in stark contrast to the actual funding of this pipeline by this government. It would appear, Mr President, that Senator Macdonald now wants the government, through questions order, on notice. Order, Senator Collins. Point of order, Senator I think Austin. it's abundantly clear that uh, we're not getting an answer to the question here. Uh, Senator Collins has virtually conceded that uh, he'll get back to answering the question when he's ready. And if you're, going to, if you're going to assert any authority on the matter, I would have thought this is a perfect opportunity to do it. Let's have answers to questions and not uh, opportunities for uh, ministers to simply put, put things on the table which are utterly irrelevant. Order. So I've indicated before that the, the minister has, in fact, already answered the question. He's, he's entitled. Order. Order. He's entitled to develop his answer if he wishes to. Senator Collins. Mr. President, provided he keeps within the broad I will area. Yes, I will conclude, uh, Mr. President, by saying that it now appears that Senator Macdonald wants the government, through questions on notice, Order. to identify regional development uh, initiatives that meet the coalition's criteria for announcement. The Minister's time has expired. <coughs> Senator Chapman. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I direct my question to the Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, Senator Bolkus. Noting the Minister's self-righteous concern in alleging conflict of interest for practising journalists working for senior politicians, I ask, is it a fact that Mr Hendrik Gout, editor of the Public Sector Review, has been in Canberra working for Senator Bolkus, while Mr Gout still works for Order. the Public Sector Review? Will the minister provide the details of Mr Gout's current employment in his office? Did Mr Gout inform his review readership of his current dual role as editor of the paper and with the minister? The Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, Senator Bowles. Mr uh, President, Order. Uh, I'll Order. very Shot. gladly uh, make uh, available whatever details of uh, the working relationship I have with uh, Henry Gout or he has with me. Um, in respect to his uh, activities with the union movement, uh, he and I share a very solid uh, and strong 
defence of the public sector, and that uh, brings us together on this particular issue. In terms of uh, any ongoing relationship with that magazine, I think that's something he's working out. I'm sure he'll be uh, uh, putting forward the facts of that as, uh, as, he, as he defines that relationship. But in terms of uh, my um, working relationship with Henry Gough, I'll come very much to the fore and I won't be uh, forging any overtime documents on his behalf. <laughs> <coughs> Senator Kerno. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for the Environment. I refer the Minister to the CityLink Tollway project backed by the Kennett Victorian Government. And I ask, Minister, do you agree that a project with significant environmental consequences and which will attract up to $600 million in federal government tax concessions should be the subject of an environmental impact statement under the provisions of the Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act 1974? Has the Treasurer or the Development Allowance Authority approached your department to request that an environmental impact statement on the project be prepared under that Act? And as the Minister responsible for that Act, will you be insisting that a proper assessment is done before any federal government money is sunk into this project, a project which the Victorian Government has exempted from much of its own environmental protection and town planning requirements? The Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, in July 1994, the Victorian government uh, announced details about the Melbourne City Link proposal, and uh, at that stage, uh, the project included the construction of a southern bypass uh, connect connecting the Westgate Freeway to the southeastern arterial, and a western bypass connecting the Tullamarine Freeway to the Westgate Freeway. Uh, the state government later decided to upgrade and widen the Tullamarine Freeway between uh, Flemington Road and Buller Road as part of the proposal. The Commonwealth uh, Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act uh, has not been triggered in relation to the Tullamarine uh, Freeway project. I understand that uh, legal advice uh, from the Attorney-General's Department to the Development Allowance Authority is that the Environment uh, the EPIP uh, Act uh, does not uh, apply to decisions by the authority in relation to the granting of infrastructure bonds or to development allowance. Uh, in the event that a Commonwealth decision or action uh, is required that is in fact subject to the Act, the Action Minister must decide uh, whether a proposal is likely to be environmentally significant and, uh, if so, uh, to uh, refer it to the Environment Protection Agency. Uh, the Environment Protection Agency would then provide uh, advice to me so that I could uh, make a decision about the level of environmental uh, assessment uh, uh, that was warranted, if in fact uh, environmental assessment was warranted. Uh, any such determination would take account of the uh, potential environmental impacts and the adequacy uh, of uh, any state assessment processes that had been undertaken. And, uh, at this stage, of course, I can't speculate uh, on, uh, on uh, Commonwealth environmental assessment requirements because of the situation that uh, I've outlined. The general principle that you raise, Senator, of course, is an important one. And I think you uh, have seen uh, a very strong commitment on the part of uh, this government and myself uh, as the Environment Minister to uh, ensure that uh, proposals or developments that uh, are environmentally significant are subject to uh, the appropriate level of uh, environmental assessment. And that is, of course, a position that uh, I won't be resiling from. And, uh, and nor will the government. But in relation to this particular matter, uh, the situation in relation to the triggering of the Environmental Protection Impact of Proposals Act is as I've outlined, uh, Senator, and uh, it is a matter that is absolutely appropriate for the uh, Victorian uh, government to progress to full and thorough assessment of uh, the environmental implications of the project. 
Supplementary, Senator Minister, Kerner. you say the Attorney General has given you advice that uh, if it's not triggered. Are you aware of the legal advice obtained by some of your colleagues, your Labor Party colleagues, and quoted in the uh, Sunday Age? And this advice indicates that if the federal government grants tax concessions, it does become legally involved in the project and is required by law to fully examine the environmental impacts of the project. Are you aware of that advice? Why is it uh, inferior to the Attorney General's advice? Which advice are you going to act on? The Minister, Senator Faulkner. Well, Mr. Uh, President, I certainly am aware of the very strong level of concern there is amongst uh, uh, members of the, uh, the Federal Labor Caucus and uh, of the Labor Party more generally in relation to this uh, particular proposal. There are very significant uh, uh, concerns. I've indicated to you what the situation is in relation to the advice uh, of the Attorney General's Department to the uh, Development uh, Allowance uh, Authority. And of course, as far as my role is concerned as the Environment Minister, it is appropriate uh, for me to, to act if and when uh, this matter is designated. And I think most people understand that that's the, uh, the situation, Senator, but I can assure you the very strong level of commitment that, uh, that I have and my colleagues have in relation to a proper and adequate level of environmental assessment for this uh, important project is not diminished, regardless of the fact that the first and primary responsibility for that assessment lies with the Victorian time government. <coughs> Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed um, to the leader of the government in the Senate. I refer to the government's latest cruel hoax, a report to be released by the employment minister suggesting that the government's 5 per cent unemployment target by the year 2000 will require economic growth of 3.5 per cent a year throughout the decade of the 1990s. Given that this government has only managed to average around 2.5 per cent a year economic growth over the first half of the decade and that you are busy slowing the economy down, isn't it simply preposterous to suggest that the government has a snowflake's hope in hell of achieving the necessary 4.5 per cent a year average growth over the second half of this decade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, for Snowflake and Hill, we're not doing a real bad job, according to The Economist, uh, this week, where in Australia was, forced to be the far was forecast to be the fastest growing economy of the major 15 OECD countries in 1996. And that, of course, would be a continuation of the record that we have been able to achieve so far. Employment uh, will continue to grow through the rest of 95 and 96 and thereafter because the outlook for economic growth does remain very robust indeed. The recent levelling off in uh, employment we see is only temporary pause, reflecting a lag response, as Senator Cook has already said, I think, today, in the labour market to the slowing in economic growth to a more sustainable rate since late uh, 1994. We're not trying to slow the economy down any further than we did. We did, of course, take the view that it was unsustainable at 6 per cent plus. That view, I think, uh, was universally shared. It had to come back to around about uh, in the uh, three and a half, four range. That's where we hope to uh, have it and to keep it. Employment growth in 95-96 is still expected to be broadly in line with the budget forecast of 3 per cent, with the unemployment rate uh, being expected to fall throughout the rest of 95-96. Uh, the job vacancy rate still remains at a high level by historic standards, and that itself is a, a key indicator of continuing employment growth. We've got uh, in Accord 8 a specific union commitment on employment growth. Under the new accord, the government and the ACT are committed to creating in excess of 600,000 jobs by March 99. We uh, have a strong endorsement for the Working Nation objective from the accord. And throughout uh, the last uh, period, and particularly since the last uh, election, the, uh, the track record of this government has been extraordinarily strong on employment. We fully expect that process to continue in the future and uh, the unemployment figures to come out in the way that we forecast as being perfectly possible. Supplementary, Senator Mr. Campbell. President, I, I presume that uh, Senator Evans is referring to so the same Economist magazine that reports Australia as having the highest inflation in the world, the thir third highest interest rates in the world and the fifth highest youth unemployment in the world. But I'd like to refer him to the Business Review Weekly that last week showed in a survey done by Access Economics that out of all of, the nation, all of the OECD nations, only two of them had unemployment that was actually rising. And bearing in mind that Australia's teen jobless rate is 29 per cent, 
which is much higher than it was when the working nation policies were first introduced. Um, could I ask the minister to answer, don't all of these indicators simply prove beyond any doubt whatsoever that your government has any answers for Australia's employment woes or economic woes and that it really is time for a change of government? Minister, Senator Mr. Mr. President, it's simply not the case that unemployment is rising. One quarter's figures do not a total story tell. The overall trends are what are important. The unemployment rate of 8.7 in October was well below the peak of 11.1 per cent in October 1993. The unemployment rate fell by 0.4 in the 12 months to October 1995. The number of unemployed in October is 18.2 per cent below the peak that was recorded in October 1993. And most importantly of all in that litany, the unemployment rate is expected to fall further to 8 per cent by the June quarter next year. And I ask that further questions. Can I? Are we up to time? I yeah. ask that further questions be placed on notice. You may raise your point of order. No. Order. It's before. I'm oh, sorry, Senator. Adams. Sorry, would you like me no, to do this? On the 22nd of uh, November, Senator Campbell asked me, as Minister representing the Prime Minister, a question without notice about the release of a Prime Minister with youth statement, youth unemployment and youth suicide. I undertook to obtain an answer for Senator Campbell. I'm happy to have it incorporated in Hansard if he's willing for me to do that. I seek leave is, accordingly. Is Thank leave you. granted? Leave is granted. <coughs> well, after question time on the 23rd of November, Senators Harradine and Heron invited me to reconsider a ruling which I made during the course of question time order to the effect that the use of the name of a senator or a member of the House of Representatives with the implication that a senator was a liar is contrary to Standing Order 193. I have reconsidered my ruling and I believe that I was correct to intervene in the way that I did. Standing Order 193 prohibits offensive words, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections in relation to senators, members of other houses and certain other protected official ho office holders. Sorry. My predecessors have consistently ruled that it is contrary to Standing Order 193 to make any suggestion that a senator has lied, <coughs> that is, deliberately and knowingly made untrue statements. Past president rulings have pointed out that it is not out of order to state that a senator's statements are untrue or misleading. The offence is constituted not by contradiction of another senator's statement, but by the implication that a senator has deliberately or knowingly made untrue statements. As one of my predecessors ruled, it is for the chair to judge whether this implication is present in any particular instance. Past rulings have pointed out that expressions which may otherwise be acceptable are disorderly when, in their context, they carry the offensive implication that a senator has lied. The rulings to which I have referred are listed at page 232 of the printed version of Odgers' Australian Senate Practice, 7th edition. During question time on the 23rd of November, Senator Ian MacDonald interjected to Senator Cook, and I quote, you will just do a comment on it. It was clear from the context of this remark that the order that the senator was using the name of a member as a substitute for a direct accusation, order, as a, as a, sorry, that the senator was using the name of a member as a substitute for a direct accusation that Senator Cook would deliberately make false statements. Subsequently, I required Senator Gareth Evans and Senator Bob Collins to withdraw expressions in which they sought to use the name of Senator Ian MacDonald in the same way. I emphasised that the offence against Standing Order 193 was contained in the, sorry, that was contained in these expressions was the implication that senators told lies. Where that implication is present, the expression is disorderly regardless of what substitute words are used. Senators have often used substitute expressions to try to get around the prohibition of, of, uh, on accusations of lying. It is obvious that the chair must intervene when this device is used because otherwise the pro prohibition could be more or less openly flouted. In order to uphold the standing orders and the standard of debate, I will continue to intervene when it is clear that a substitute expression is being used to subvert the prohibition and to make the forbidden imp implication that senators are lying. In the course of question time, Senator Ian MacDonald referred to an answer to a question by Senator Gareth, Gareth Evans, and I quote, 
as coming from the leader of the party that is seen as the greatest mob of liars in history. As that remark clearly implied that Senator Evans and his colleagues in the, state, in the Senate are liars, I required Senator Macdonald to withdraw the remark. In the noise which followed, interjections by Senator Macdonald and others, most of which are not recorded in Hansard, persuaded me that Senator Macdonald had not said what in fact he had said and is recorded in Hansard. I therefore did not persist with the requirement for a withdrawal. Senator Macdonald's expression, however, was clearly disorderly. Rulings of my predecessors have made it quite clear that words which are offensive when used against a particular senator are equally offensive, if not more offensive, when used against a group of senators. Again, the past rulings are recorded at page 232 of Rogers. In concluding this statement, I observed that the Senate has been extremely unruly during question time in recent weeks, and it has not been possible for the Chair in the general disorder to censure every disorderly expression. I simply say to senators, as I've said on previous occasions, that the recent behaviour of some of them during question time is bringing both those senators and the institution into disrepute. I again appeal for appropriate standards of debate and conduct to be restored to our proceedings. Few senators have not complained at some time about the low standing in which MPs and senators are held by the public, yet in the one hour of question time each day, the activities of a few senators, and I mean only a few, does more to diminish that standing than most other activities at other times. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Mr. President, I'd like to ask a question to, of you uh, to amplify the meaning of your statement. Am I to read from your statement? That you're, se you're seeking leave to, to to ask a question. To take note. Well, all of right, you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. D does it mean that your statement, in fact, means that you regard the word Carmen as synonymous with lying? The answer to that is quite clearly no, and it's obviously no. So therefore it is not, it's not an offensive <coughs> use of the, of I've, the language? I've made it quite clear. I suggest you go away, read the statement, and it will be quite clear I to you, I listened to it very carefully. That's the reason for the question, Mr President. Well, it is a nonsense question. Let Thank me you, tell Mr you that. President. Senator Alston, are you seeking can I, leave? Can I have leave to? Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Uh, well, can, I say, can I say this, uh, Mr President? Uh, as I recall it, uh, why we took exception uh, last week to your statement was that you said that a reference to a senator would be construed in a particular manner. Now, if you'd gone on and said uh, a reference which contains an adverse inference or imputation, now this looks very important because uh, I have heard this president on a number of occasions get to his feet and lecture Order. us about about the Order. standing of politicians being held in very low esteem. And I simply want to say this. If you want a, a real understanding Order. of why that might be the case, you ought to reflect on the fact that we are, like any other citizens, uh, when an issue is put to us which we think is exaggerated, or where we think the logic does not follow, or where we take a point of order and we ask for a ruling, we normally expect that there will be some logic in the answer. Now, if you simply say, in answer to a point of order on relevance, I rule that that is not irrelevant, or I, I, I put down your point of order, without giving any reasons, without, uh, in a sense, engaging the questioner, as your two predecessors have done in this place, and I've, uh, I've served under both uh, Senators um, uh, Doug McClelland and Kerry Sybra, and each of those presidents were conspicuous by their willingness to respond constructively to points of order. Now, we didn't expect them to give us uh, 51 per cent, the other side 49, and indeed we'd probably have settled, we'd probably have settled for 70-30. But what I do say is that they were able to control this chamber because Order. of their willingness Order. to provide answers that made some sense. And if you are simply going to dismissively ignore points of order or, or, uh, or give answers to questions which suggest that you're not serious about the content of your answers, then you will get what you expect, what others would expect. And I simply say to you, this was yet another example of a situation in which the words you used were so general that they invited people to take issue with them. And if you, if you now, on reflection, uh, appreciate what I'm putting to you, what you should have said and what you should say now is that where it is clear from the use of an expression that it is simply a subterfuge for, 
inferring improper conduct. We can appreciate that proposition. But that's not what you said the other day, and you ought to think carefully about the way in which you respond to points of order on this side of the chamber. Senator, contribute very Senator, briefly to this debate. Senator when you Evans, made, Mr. President, a perfectly Ms. simple, Lee straightforward. Ms. Lee granted. Leave is granted. Senator, when you've made, as you have, a perfectly simple, straightforward, and self-evidently compelling statement, you should not have to defend yourself from that sort of second-rate attack, which would be out of place in Senator Malston's more natural forum, the Bundura Magistrates Court, or wherever it is that he cut his teeth and where he still ought to be cutting them, if that's the quality of his performance. The point, Mr Order. President, as you are acutely aware and is perfectly evident in the terms of your statement, everything that is said in this place has a context, and what determines whether or not it's colourable or unparliamentary or not is the context. And When you responded as you did the other day, you were responding to someone's name being used in a particular context which unequivocally conveyed imputations of an unhappy kind which were manifestly unparliamentary. It was in that context that you, of course, responded at the time. It's not necessary to spell out every detail of an innuendo or an imputation when it's supremely self-evident to all those within your hearing as to what that innuendo or imputation is. You did not do so on that occasion because it was unnecessary. In the terms of the statement you have just put down, you have made perfectly clear that it's the context that counts. You've said that very, very clearly in that statement. I'm one of the uh, persons who uh, bore your wrath the other day when I joined in the debate using exactly the same utterly adolescent and discredited technique which was initiated on the other side, and you, uh, you slapped me oh, down no. accordingly, but it's perfectly appropriate for you to do so. The terms of your statement are perfectly clear. Let's have no more of this nonsense. You don't need to defend yourself. It's self-evidently a compelling statement. Senator Crichton Brown, you, you don't need to seek leave because Senator Newman actually moved a, a motion. So. I, thought she, I, th I thought she sought leave to ask a question. No, well, she sought leave to, to take note of the answer, and I, uh, that, that has to be. Uh, okay. She moves, sorry, to take note of the answer. Thanks, Mr. President. Look, uh, uh, I, I, in part, ask you a question, but I also, in part, make an observation. My understanding is that your ruling is not based on a particular name or an inference that that particular person has a reputation for telling untruths, but that. It is, it is a set of words used in the context of challenging somebody else's veracity that leads you to the conclusion that they're implying the name used is the substitution for, for telling the truth or, or claiming an untruth. For instance, it's not a question of somebody having a reputation. There are people in the chamber, in my view, who, who don't have a reputation but deserve one. It might well be that the name Carmen could be substituted for Sue, but I take it that what you're saying is that no name, no name is quarantined from your ruling. You are simply saying that if a name in the context is put in such a way as to draw the conclusion in the mind of a reasonable person that the inference is that, those, that, that a lie is to be told then that is to be ruled um, out of order. And if that's what you're saying, sir, with respect, I thoroughly agree. I've never supported the use of the word lie in any context, notwithstanding the precedent set by my dear friend Bill Sneddon in the other place and then stared down by, by the then leader of the opposition or then leader of, no, the then uh, shadow minister for uh, industrial relations, R.G. Hawke, later to be a prime minister. I've always taken the view that it's an unparliamentary language and ought not be allowed, and there ought to be, ought to be no way that any word which implies or implicitly suggests a lie ought to be accepted. And I, I hope I say that in the context as one that's had my share of criticism from my own side for being fair and, and, and impartial. <coughs> Senator Betts. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, during the debate that's uh, taken place, I've had the opportunity to read page 232 of Vodgers to which you refer, and uh, you are quite correct, uh, and indeed Senator Crichton-Brown is quite correct, that it is for the chair to judge whether that implication is present in any particular instance. But might I suggest to you, sir, that you create a very dangerous precedent for yourself and the other chairs uh, in this Senate 
Because if, for example, during the course of an answer or a debate, a minister or person on the other side is having a difficulty recalling, for example, and somebody on this side were to suggest that that is akin to Carmen Lawrence, people in the chair may well feel that they have to rule that out of order. Because as soon as you suggest that a name becomes synonymous with a lie, you, all, you then take away the possibility of using that name in the context of somebody having a bad memory, somebody being unable to recall. And whilst I agree with the general thrust of uh, your ruling as to the general implication, as soon as you make that ruling, sir, you and all the other people that occupy the chair in this chamber will have to exercise their mind on every single occasion as to whether or not uh, the name Carmen Lawrence is unparliamentary in that particular circumstance. And uh, therefore, sir, it is not appropriate to say that the use of Carmen Lawrence as an interjection is disorderly. It's got to be in the context, and as a result, the chair will now have to consider on each and every occasion whether or not whatever the name being used is uh, reflecting of a uh, lie, of bad memory or incapacity to recall. And I just suggest uh, to you that that creates a very difficult precedent uh, for you and uh, your successors and those who uh, take uh, the position of a temporary chair uh, in this place. <coughs> Senator Heron. President, I, th I thank you for your response to my letter. I do not believe that it answers the question that I posed in that letter, and I will be studying your response carefully, and uh, I expect to be writing to you again for further reconsideration. In, in very brief response, because I, sorry, Senator Ian Macdonald. President, I'm not sure whether I should speak on the motion to take note or uh, uh, in some other way, but uh, Mr. President, I haven't read your statement. Unfortunately, I wasn't aware you were going to be making it. Uh, my staff tells me that my name appeared perhaps uh, more frequently in your statement than any others, and that seems to be part of, part of uh, uh, something that's been happening in this chamber in uh, uh, recent times. Uh, so I haven't had the opportunity of uh, uh, fully reading what you've said, but I did, uh, as I got back to my office, um, uh, hear you say in relation to my comment, uh, which I've just got hands out to look at, and which uh, I said, uh, coming from Senator Everett, coming from the leader of the party that seems the greatest mob of liars in history, that's a bit rich. You said ought to withdraw that. Uh, the Hansard records me then saying, as, what did I say? And you said, uh, according to Hansard, unless I misheard you, you called the other side uh, uh, house of the house liars. And then uh, I'm recorded as saying, what I said is allowed. As I recall your statement, and you might uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you then went and said there was a great deal of noise coming from this side, which Senator Macdonald was uh, part of, and most of it isn't recorded. Now, if you did say that, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, that, is totally un that, that is totally untruthful, and I demand from you an apology. You might recall, Mr. President, that I was standing on my feet trying to ask my supplementary. There was noise. Uh, it wasn't from me. And I'm not being sensitive about this, but your statement does mention me so many times that I, uh, you know, I happen to just get the feeling that uh, you know, perhaps I should be a little bit sensitive about uh, these things. Now, I wasn't speaking at that time. I was standing here. There may have been other noise, but the imputation from your uh, uh, statement, as I, as I recall what you said, and I haven't uh, had the opportunity of reading it, as I say, because it hasn't been published, and uh, I wasn't told that you were going to be making this statement. But as I recall, the imputation was that I was shouting at you at that particular time. Now, I may have been shouting at you at other times, but on that time, uh, uh, that is uh, incorrect. And if that was the imputation in your statement, then I ask you to apologise and correct it. Well, very briefly, in response, I did quite clearly define the reasons last week for the decision that I had taken, and I repeated that, repeated that definition, having considered it in the statement that I have just made, and I suggest that all senators read it. On Senator Abetz's point, it is not a problem, Senator, in my opinion. Your, your contribution was constructive. 
but I don't think it's a problem. The context is the thing that's important, and it's quite clear to me that some contexts are, in, uh, are breaking that Rule 193 when they substitute the, for the word liar the word of a person, and they're clearly, uh, they're clearly designed to flout that uh, standing order. There are others where it's equally clearly not the case, and as in all things, context is important and the judgment of the chair must come to bear. On uh, Senator Macdonald's point, the statement that I did make, Senator, is in the noise which followed interject interjections by Senator Macdonald and others, most of which are not recorded in Hansard, persuaded me that the Senator Macdonald had not said what in fact he had said and recorded in Hansard, and therefore did not persist with the requirement of withdrawal. There were a number of interjections which were trying to clarify the issue of what you'd said. And as for um, picking you out, I'd, uh, I'd deny that, but uh, I suggest that you might look carefully at your own record uh, and that might, uh, might settle things. You say interjections by we, Senator Macdonald and others, most of which are not You've already spoken to this uh, resolution. Oh, so you're stopping me, Speaker? No, well, if you want to seek leave, you can seek leave. You seek leave, leave to leave. query the leave statements is, you've just made. Leave, leave granted. Leave's granted. Thank you, Mr President. You're saying interjections by Senator Macdonald and, and others, uh, mm. so, so you say now. Um, and uh, that suggested that I was uh, interjecting uh, quite uh, a lot while you were speaking. What I'm saying to you, Mr Chairman, is that is simply not correct. And I think if you uh, get a uh, copy of the, uh, of the television uh, tape, uh, you'll see that that's uh, correct. I mean, I don't know what it uh, says, but I was standing here trying to ask the question. Now, I'm not unduly sensitive about this, Mr Chairman, but you've mentioned me so many times. Uh, sorry? Order. Not all about anything else. Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you, Gary. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I just uh, uh, I, I would what I have said, uh, which you might call as an interjection, is recorded in the Senate, and uh, the suggestion that you make, uh, I think, is uh, unfair. But, and, and I don't accuse you of this, but uh, you know, there's obviously an orchestrated to campaign by Gary and, and the rest of his team, and I would hate you to be drawn into that campaign in the way you responded here. Well, that, it, in, in direct response to that, it was my clear recollection and the recollection of the clerks who advised me. Senator, point of order, point of order, order. Mr. President. Uh, Senator in, Olson. in the course of Senator Macdonald's remarks, he said quite clearly that he was taking exception to uh, your criticism of him on that particular occasion. and He went on to say, uh, I might have uh, been guilty of uh, uh, loud interjections on other occasions, but I wasn't on this occasion. That was the thrust of his remarks. And he invited you to respond to that. And your response to it was effectively, uh, well, look at your own track record. Now, I interpret that as meaning simply, I'm not prepared to even argue about what you said on this particular or did on this particular occasion, but because of other events, therefore you're guilty on this occasion. That is, that is precisely the sort of faulty logic that causes us to erupt. Because if you want to say to him, "You're wrong," I have a clear recollection and I disagree with you, or "Let's agree to disagree," or "I can't remember, but that's how it seemed to me," I'd understand all of that. But to simply say, when he goes out of his way to say, look, I might have on other occasions, but I didn't hear, and you effectively saying, I don't care about what you did on this occasion, you've done it in the past, that, that breaks all the norms of uh, presumptions of innocence or any other uh, way in which people respond to arguments. And that is why, that is why we do have uh, difficulties with your rulings, because you don't address the issues. You very quickly resort to ad hominem attacks, as that was. Uh, you rely on uh, what you call the context of a, an answer to justify uh, what are meandering and irrelevant answers in, on many occasions, in our view, and you never deal with the issues themselves. Well, in, in brief response to that, I made it clear that it was my understanding that uh, Senator Macdonald, along with others, was interjecting, and that was the recollection of the clerks. I'll go back to that and have a look at it. The more general comment was in relation to the more general concern that Senator Macdonald had, and I made that with no malice, and I don't bear any malice to anybody. The, motion, the question is that the motion that of uh, Senator Newman to take note of that uh, answer be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. Are there any other motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Chee. Senator, Senator Crane. Point. Mr. President. Senator, 
about Can you just clarify order. for us whether the taking note of your answer is proposed to be taken out of the 30 minutes or not? No. No, thank you. No. Senator Crane. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I uh, rise to take note of the answer by uh, Senator Evans to Senator Hill's uh, question today. And the substance of that question was to get a response from the government with regard to uh, the fear and loathing campaign, uh, which is outlined in a document from the South Australian United Trades and Labor Council, uh, which was leaked or fell off the back of a truck last week. And I think, uh, Mr. President, in dealing with this, it highlights, or well, what has just occurred in this place, highlights the type of tactics that are being used now in the parliamentary scene, emanating from the Labor Party, which create a situation whereby there is a reaction from this side of politics uh, to the um, dishonesty that is being perpetrated into politics today. And we read through this particular document which uh, we have here, and we find uh, such comments. There are sp specific federal campaigns which unions, the ACTU, the UTLC, are involved in. They mention Western Australia, they mention uh, CRA um, and others. And we further go into, into this particular document where it also makes reference to running a fear and loathing campaign on individual contracts that we must define the scope of the message very clearly and stick to it. It's nothing to do with the merit of the case that the Labor Party might have to run or the merit of the case that we might have to run. It is to totally run a dishonest, uh, deliberately dishonest campaign with regard to what exists. And we look further into the document here and uh, it says, the initial idea is to play on the mood of tired of change, uncertain, etc. Hidden cameras in the boss's office as boss threatening workers with new contracts or else. Details of contract are to be out of focus. That's what is in this particular document. And it makes one wonder in terms of the answer to the question, uh, a question of mine last week from Senator Evans himself, when he said the problem with CRA was that they offered too large a carrots. In fact, I'll quote. Uh, the exact words, initially through the offering of large-sized carrots. That's what the minister said last week. Yet here we have in terms of this particular campaign, and on that, that occasion Senator Evans was absolutely accurate. But we have been confronted with this campaign, uh, this fear and loathing campaign, which is uh, based on the total misrepresentation of what the truths are and the facts of a particular matter is. And it's quite shameful, uh, in my view, in terms of what uh, the South Australian Trades and Labor Council is doing, or the West Australian Labor Council, or even the backing that is coming from this particular government in terms of that campaign. It's time that they came clean on their particular campaigns, were honest about what the situations were, and not have this fear and loathing campaign which exists. And I hope that some of them just had a look yesterday on the Sunday program at the interviews that were done up at Hammersley, a subsidiary of CRA. And I just want to quote as I remember, they're not the exact words, but they spoke to a contract worker. And what did he say? No longer do we leave our brains on the gatepost as we go to work. They spoke to a unionist. It has been good for us. No strikes, uh, no injury free time, or no injuries, record free injury time, I should say, and more money. That was from the unionist who said, we don't want to go onto the contract, but we work here and it's good for us. And as we work, work through this whole process of what's uh, happening in this campaign, first of all in Western Australia, we also see here in today's Newcastle Herald where the uh, coal strike has reached 105 days at Vickery. One has to put to the government how many times has the uh, AIRC ordered them back to work, as Senator Evans sitting across there knows, on a significant number of times. But the government has been absolutely quiet not a squeak out of them in terms of saying, hey boys, it's about time you uh, obeyed the rules of the particular umpire. So I'm bringing this uh, point to the uh, attention of the Senate and uh, I have to conclude by saying, Madam Deputy President, I think this is probably the lowest that the Labor Party, in conjunction with the union movement, has stepped in terms of dealing with a particular political situation. And I think this campaign, this proposed campaign, should be condemned totally outright, and it's about time the Labor Party became a little bit honest about what they're doing and got back to dealing with issues on their merit. The question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. 
Senator Ochi. Madam Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the answer given to me by Senator Evans today in relation in answer to my question. And in so doing, it is worth noting, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Mr Campbell is a member of the government that gave us the racial hatred bill, that Mr Campbell is a member Mr Campbell, Mr Graham Campbell, is a member of the government which, which has berated the opposition, that Mr Graham Campbell is a member of the same government that on Thursday tried an appalling stunt in which they attempted to rewrite history over the white Australia policy, which their government invented. And, Madam Deputy President, Mr Campbell is somebody who has consistently and willfully singled out different ethnic groups in this country for his own bile, bigotry and hatred. And it's about time that in the 1990s the Prime Minister showed just the tiniest touch of leadership about the way in which the Australian Labor Party is run. In answer to my question today, Senator Evans said, how we deal with these things is none of your business. It is our business. Mr Graham Campbell went to the Australians Against Further Immigration to spread not only bigotry and hatred, but also, Madam Deputy President, to ask them for their preferences for the Labor Party. And what did Mr Campbell say to Australians Against Further Immigration? He said, there are other people in the Labor Party just like me, and that's why you should give us your preferences. That is the attitude. One or two. Who are the others, Senator Evans? Who are the others? No, in the federal parliamentary party, Senator Evans. And the bigotry, the bigotry that we have received from the other side on these matters is thoroughly unacceptable. It is our business that the standards that people expect of members of parliament are adhered to. It is our business. It is the business of every single member of parliament to fight against hatred and intolerance. And that's what we on this side of the chamber seek to do. What Mr Graham Campbell did was an insult to every ethnic Greek, ethnic Italian, ethnic Chinese, ethnic Indian, ethnic Yugoslav in this country. An insult to everybody who is not Anglo-Celtic. Because in Mr Campbell's view of the world, you're not a real Australian unless you're Anglo-Celtic. Not even Anglo. Well, Anglo-Celtic is what he said, Senator Bell. And what that says to probably half the population of this country is that they can never truly be Australian. And it's always been my understanding that being Australian was a thing which was inclusive, not exclusive. That a person was a good Australian based on quality of their character, not the colour of their skin. And yet Mr Campbell wishes to continue with this, and the Prime Minister, through his silence, gives tacit support to the bigotry which we have received from Mr Graham Campbell. That is what disturbs me. It is our business. And I don't care what the Prime Minister says to Mr Graham Campbell behind closed doors. What the Australian public demands of the Prime Minister is that in public he stands up against intolerance, stands up against hatred and stands up against Mr Graham Campbell. But the Prime Minister is too weak and too cowardly to do it. The Prime Order Minister Senator. will not make a stand Order against— Order, Senator. I think you should withdraw that imputation against the Prime I Minister. withdraw, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Prime Minister is too weak and too lacking in moral fortitude to stand up against Mr Campbell and his ilk. The Prime Minister is quite happy to have Mr Campbell go and canvass preferences for the Labor Party, but he won't stand up against him on a matter of principle. And it is quite clear that Mr Keating would rather tolerate Mr Campbell's presence in the parliamentary Labor Party than stand up for principle and for what is right and decent in this country. And that is why Mr Campbell should go, and if Mr Campbell doesn't go, Mr Keating himself should tender his resignation to the Australian people as somebody unfit to hold the high office which he currently occupies. question is, Sen same matter, Senator Benizzo. Madam Benizzo. Deputy President, uh, uh, I 
like to address uh, this question somewhat also, and I was very disappointed uh, to see, to hear Mr. Campbell say what he did uh, last Saturday in Sydney. The point I really want to take up is that uh, he said that the real Australia was Anglo-Celtic, and uh, I take exceptional offence to that. I think uh, Senator Chi did point that one out because. Uh, he, perhaps he was right in saying it was Anglo-Celtic. It was, was past tense, but it certainly is not now, and I take great exception. Because if I may put, look, point to the Italian community, I believe that between first, second, and third generation, there could be up to 15% influence in Australia, and uh, even if they've got that 15%, or even less than 15%, I think for the numbers they've had more influence in Australia, in industry, in the building industry, in the farming industry, even in politics these days. I'm not talking about myself. There is, there is another one in Perth, an Italian that's a member of the WA State Parliament and a minister, and there's other various ones around Australia that I believe have, has contributed to Australia. And by the same definition, even Senator Schott probably is not a real Australian. And, uh, you know, uh, I think he ought to be right, Mr. Campbell, for that. But having said that, and the question was asked, why will uh, the, uh, the fourth generation? I didn't quite get to that. Well, if you get the fourth generation German, even they might have half the influence the Italians have got. <laughs> but, but the point is, the question was asked, why will no, uh, the Prime Minister not call uh, for? Uh, disendorsement of the Labor candidate for the next election. I am sure that he won't call for his disendorsement because the Prime Minister knows that Mr Campbell would probably still win it, uh, win it as an independent. It would be more likely to be won by the Liberal Party should he be disendorsed, but uh, Mr Campbell would have a fair sort of chance of being re-elected, and I know the Prime Minister is not going to uh, uh, take that uh, take that chance, but I'm just wondering, Madam Deputy President, if the agenda doesn't go a bit beyond that. I'm hoping I could be wrong in saying what I'm going to say now, but is it the agenda of this government to have a Mr. Campbell there, happily uh, letting the media call him irrelevant or whatever? they like to think about him, because they don't think he's really irrelevant in Kalgoorlie, I'm afraid to say. Kalgoorlie is my, my own seat, uh, the electorate that I am in. They don't really think he's irrelevant in Kalgoorlie, but I'm wondering if the government is really happy to have him there and then go out and canvass these issues that uh, if there is Australians, uh, you know, there are some Australians that think that the the Labor's immigration policy is not what they want, whether they can see Graham Campbell or Mr Graham Campbell as a saviour for their thoughts. And perhaps that's why the Prime Minister is not happy or not prepared to call for this endorsement. I hasten again to say I hope I am wrong in that matter, but while Mr Campbell is there and Mr Keating hasn't said anything yet about him to my knowledge, I know Senator Evans said what he said at this question time, but the Prime Minister, to my knowledge, has said nothing. Perhaps he's happy to leave him there and hoping that... Uh, and he did ask for those preferences that come from uh, Australians against further immigration. So it is up to the Prime Minister now to rule out what I've said and also do something about Mr Campbell. question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Abetz. Yeah, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I wish to take note of the answer or move to take note of the answer given by Senator Crowley earlier today. This is now the second occasion on which uh, Senator Crowley has used a question from the Labor Party to try to demonise the Lions Forum. And uh, the purpose that the reason I get up today is simply to set the record straight. It is unfortunate that we need to set the record straight, but to uh, simply outline yet again what the Lions Forum is all about. It's a group of members and senators of the Federal, Liberal and National Parties that have adopted the following statement as its motto. 
the foundation of a nation's greatness is in the homes of its people. And uh, those sentiments are accepted by myself and all other members of the Lions Forum. As their contribution to the International Year of the Family, the Lions Forum embarked upon hearings throughout the Commonwealth of Australia. Such luminaries as now Senator Jacinta Collins, while she was uh, representing the Shop Distributives Union, in fact made a contribution to the hearing. What the document Empowering Australian Families, published by the Lions Forum, did was to set out in summary form a whole host of submissions put to them. The only submissions that they adopted are in fact, Madam Deputy President, shown on the Roman numeral page 7 executive summary. There is no mention whatsoever, Madam Deputy President, of a French quotient system to which uh, Senator Crowley referred to in the Lions Forum recommendations. The French quotient system to which uh, Senator Crowley referred is part of a section in this report entitled Macroeconomic Reform. And there were some other things mentioned under that heading, Madam Deputy President, such things as Julian Disney, who made the following comment, there can be little doubt that at present many one-income families are treated unfairly under the taxation system by comparison with two-income families. And this is after a decade or more of Labor government having control of the, the tax system and uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Keating, having his hands on the economic levers. And under the uh, taxation system, uh, the following example was mentioned. Our current taxation system is one which is based on the income of the individual and it does not recognise the differences in individuals' capacities to pay tax. For example, a single person with no dependents earning $30,000 per annum pays the same amount of tax as a married person who is the sole breadwinner for a family with two children who earns $30,000 per annum. This system is of clear disadvantage to the person who is married with two children, as that person has three dependents, compared with the individual who supports only her or himself. The married person with the children has a different capacity to pay tax, which the individual-based taxation system fails to recognise. The report then, in dealing with that problem, Madam Deputy President, outlines some uh, proposals, and one which was put before the Lions Forum was the French quotient system. Nowhere in the report does the Lions Forum adopt the French quotient system. I must say, reading it, Madam Deputy President, it would sound a very nice and fair system, but given our current uh, economic structure and taxation burden, uh, uh, I doubt that we could necessarily implement that uh, system in Australia. But uh, one thing that uh, has to be recognised is that at least the Lions Forum has acknowledged the very real disadvantage of single income families where the need of children and spouse are required to be met, something that Senator Crowley never seems to accept. This government, after 12 years, 13 years in office, has not addressed those very real problems that are hurt, hurting the battlers within the community. Can I say, possibly more in sorrow rather than in anger to Senator Crowley, instead of trying to develop maps to find, for men to find their ways around supermarkets, she ought to try to find a map that will show her the way to the truth. The question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Petitions. Senator Campbell. I wanted to move to take note of a question, uh, an answer given by Senator Evans uh, to a question I asked him in relation to youth unemployment. Madam Deputy President, I must say that I am incredulous at the response not only to my uh, question today from Senator Evans, representing the Prime Minister in this place, but also to the answer he provided uh, to a question uh, I gave him, I think it was last, uh, was the 22nd of uh, November 1995, where I also asked him um, 
about youth unemployment and youth suicide and the, this government's lack of attention, uh, and if, if indeed not just a lack of attention but a lack of uh, action on these matters, um, wherein Senator Evans uh, said, said in the chamber that day—that was back on the 22nd of November—that um, he didn't have any information on that, um, and he'd, he'd give me an instant answer. Now, I, just, I put that in context, Madam Deputy President. This is a government that, whenever you ask them about youth issues, or whenever they make a statement about youth issues publicly, they say these are a matter of incredible moment for the government, that they're giving the, you know, the highest level of consideration uh, to these matters. Um, and of course, when the Prime Minister's representative in the Senate is asked a question about youth unemployment or youth suicide, he's unable to answer. He doesn't have a brief. Now, I put it to you that that is an incredible indictment upon this government. I mean, we have an enormously high, and the, the rate is 29 per cent. And you find, um, when Senator Schott answered a, a question on this matter today, um, in fact, virtually word for word, giving the information that Senator Evans has uh, given to me uh, in his subsequent answer, um, that, that they go through the, st the statistical reasons why it's 29 per cent, and almost say that it's not a bad thing. I mean, he didn't say that. They're saying. Uh, and I'll quote from Senator Evans' answer to my question, and I think if you check against the Hansard, um, you'll find it's virtually verbatim from the brief that Senator Schott was reading from during the same question time today. Uh, and I quote, in terms of Senator Campbell's claim that youth unemployment is 29 per cent, this is the rate for 15 to 19-year-olds looking for full-time work, seasonally adjusted. Well, that's what it is. That's what the youth unemployment rate is. I, I continue to quote, the official unemployment rate for 19, 15 to 19-year-olds as measured by the Australian Bureau of Statistics is 19.6 per cent October 1995 original data. In May 1994, when the government announced Working Nation, the full-time unemployment rate for 15 to 19-year-olds was 32.6 per cent seasonally adjusted, while the unemployment rate for 15 to 19-year-olds was 23.2 per cent original data. So, I mean, I'm sure that statement, and I read it only particularly for the benefit of uh, younger people who are listening to this debate at the moment. What does that mean to you? I bet most of them have no contemplation. The reality is Australia has a youth unemployment crisis, yet this government contents itself to say, well, look, we've got Working Nation uh, and we, uh, we're very concerned about it. But the reality, of course, is very different. The youth unemployment rate is actually going up. And if you look at general unemployment, and I was reading a Business Review Weekly article um, on, on Thursday night on the aeroplane, and saw that they did a business review weekly, and this relates to the question I asked today, did an analysis of all of the unemployment rates in most of the Western nations, the OECD nations. And only two nations had unemployment rates that were actually going up. That is, we're getting higher unemployment in Australia and also in Germany. Every other nation in the Western world has unemployment going down. We've got it going up. And the point I was trying to get to in my question to the leader of the government, who clearly didn't want to answer the question, was why are we going to achieve a 5 per cent unemployment rate by the year 2000 unless there's a change of policies, unless there's a change of government, I put it to you? And of course he said he didn't indicate any policy change. He just said, we'll go along the way we're going. We'll have high interest rates, we'll have high inflation, but somehow miraculously we'll have this reduction uh, of unemployment from close to 9 per cent down to 5 per cent. And I think the most remarkable thing that's happened today is in this report that Simon Crean's brought out, the Minister for Employment and Training has brought out, is that they're now predicting unemployment in the year 2005 will be 4 per cent. So just as unemployment starts going up, they've said, yes, we'll still achieve 5 per cent even though growth's gone down in the year 2000, but don't worry, in the year 2005 it'll be even better, it'll only be 4 per cent. And I put it to the minister, the next time unemployment goes up, what he's likely to do is actually say in the year 2010 it'll only be 3 per cent. And, and I tell you what, by the time we get to year 2020, it's going to be nirvana. You kids up there in the gallery, look forward to the year 2020 because it'll be negative 2 per cent unemployment. On the way this government's going, on its reports, on what it says to the people, we're really looking good on employment. Even though it's going up at the moment, even though the trend for the Labor government is increasing levels of unemployment, don't Order, worry, Senator. in the year 2010, time, she'll be time right. Your time has expired. The question is, the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Petitions.